Siegel Talks at the Martin Siegel Theater Center, the great graduate center, CUNY in the middle of Manhattan in Midtown, New York, that looks in a way fuller than uh, uh, with people on the street than it was the last weeks and months ago. The stores are more and more of them actually are empty. So it's confusing what we see out there. We first time spotted people who have suitcases on wheels and um, and so it must be tourists and not just uh, uh, people from uh, maybe Rikers Island who go into the hotels or, or, or people who are replanted or helped in from the streets. So um, the mood is great. People are outside. They are talking. Nobody really knows what you put on the mask or not. Do you take it down when the waiter comes? But all in all, um, things are moving um, forward in a good way. We think there's, I think, good leadership. Some news from the world are very troubling, especially from India. It is catastrophic. We heard from our Indian uh, colleagues and uh, Anarupa Roy, who um, actually also was with us. She's in the hospital at the moment, struggling uh, for her life. Um, and uh, Abhishek, uh, one of our uh, contacts in India, a great writer on playwright, is up all night with his volunteer group to connect uh, uh, people who need corona help uh, with hospitals, the few that remain. They're all volunteers and just two people of his group died. So it's stunning um, of what is happening. So on the other hand, we hear, heard also great news about, for example, about Chile last week from Martin and Marco about this great referendum. Their constitution will be rewritten. Uh, it's a sensational uh, um, um, development of an election that will now help to overturn a constitution since the, the Pinochet years. So um, the world is uh, in flux as always, nothing stays what it is. And we are wondering, where are we? Where are we coming from? And um, where are we going to? And um, today we have uh, guests um, and with us who are also part in, uh, of world theater, global theater, world theater history. It is the form that is called kind of Yiddish theater, um, uh, a very, very significant, I think, contribution that was made uh, towards um, the uh, uh, towards the idea of what theater is, means, where it comes from, uh, what it carries. And um, so today we have with us Ellen, Yelena, and um, also Shane, three veterans um, of the scene. And I think I um, really want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, before I read your uh, bios and we learn more about what you do, where are you uh, now, uh, 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 Shane? Where are you? I think you don't have your- Right now I'm in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, visiting my mother for the first time in a year and a half. Oh my God, is it your first trip out of New York? Uh, no, actually, uh, thereby hangs a tale, which we'll get into, but Alan, Yelena, and I played theater on the road, socially distanced in Hackettstown, New Jersey. Fantastic, socially distant Yiddish theater. And uh, uh, Alan and Yelena, where are you guys? We're here in front of the computer. And uh, are you uh, in? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I got a little confused. Where you're in you? Allentown, Allentown, and Yelena Town. <laughs> if, you? if if you've ever been to Yiddish theater, you'll understand why we like to do it socially distanced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Most of our audience members like to stay as far away from each other as possible because they know each other and they know that's the wisest thing to do. So you are in New York City at the moment? Yeah, we are very much, very near the CUNY Grad Center, very near the Siegel Center. Amazing, amazing. I had no, had no idea. So let me tell our audience um, a little bit. Uh, let's start with Shane. Um, he is one of the great actors of the Yiddish stage uh, today uh, in, in the Americas. And he started as Vladimir in Beckett, so waiting for uh, Godot, I think, is the one by Moshe Yasur. Um, uh, what he directed. Um, yes, correct. It's Moshe's uh, production. Yeah, one of the great directors of Yiddish theater, one of the old masters who learned himself um, um, from the old masters. I hope um, he is uh, listening. And the New Yorker uh, was um, um, very highly uh, full of praise for that uh, exceptional uh, production of the Congress. Uh, and where did you do it at the... Uh... Uh, we did it at uh, Castillo. The Castillo uh, Theater, the All Stars yeah. Theater. We also were invited uh, to tour it, and um, so he is a, a, a Yiddishist. He says, uh, um, and um, they, he is a dedicated part of his life, um, and, you know, to this uh, great form, that great tradition um, of 
a Yiddish theater, and uh, they produced also the Debu book, the Debu book, um, a very significant, perhaps the most well known, and perhaps also the best uh, play coming um, out of out of Yiddish theater, and and many many others. And he also worked with a company that is very significant for New York City, for the history of New York City, for the history of avant-garde, in a way, even for the history of the New York punk music movement. It's the ridiculous um, theater company, a very important uh, contribution at the Siegel Center. I think we hosted the 50 year celebration and I hope one day we might also get Quentin here or others you know, to, to talk about how they are doing. Um, and then with us also is Alan Lewis Rickman and he is a director, translator and writer and uh, they did uh, uh, so many, uh, so many works. You can look it up and uh, see it. We also, in our email announcement, put them out. But everything that is everything in the Yiddish theater, he has done, um, and um, he really uh, is um, uh, together also with the other represents the soul in a way of Yiddish theater here in uh, New York. A work that also the Fox Bina carries on. Um, of course, they are very famous, uh, both of them, he and Yelena, for being in the Coen Brothers movie, A Serious Man. And that's a significant uh, uh, credit. And I think, uh, Ellen, you also were in Boardwalk Empire. I think I saw you there somewhere hanging around with the gangsters um, and, um, and many, many more things, even so you didn't even mention it. Uh, Yelena Schmulenson is perhaps best known for killing the, the book in the Coen Brothers Oscar nominated film. And she is responsible of the miserable life, uh, you know, of Michael Stuhlberg centuries later. So we all have to see it as a, a fantastic, but um, she's also in Orange and the New Black, Bottled Empire, so many, many, many things. And, but of course, in the center of, I think it's fair to say of their love for this theater, for the work for this theater is that thing that is called um, Yiddish theater. She's also a Russian Yiddish coach trainer and a translator, and she has got many awards um, for her recorded books um, in, in English. So um, you guys, we of course know, I think at least a little bit, you know, what Yiddish theater is all about. Um, who, who for the audience, we also have international literates, maybe give us a little, a little context about that form, where does it come from, and um, how do you keep it alive? Um, I don't know who would start with that. Jane, you, you me, you later. I'll let the theoreticians do the work. Well, uh, Alan uh, is the is the great expert in Goldfaden. Uh -huh. I mean, Pre-Goldfaden, pre pre there's not a lot of Yiddish theater. He's considered mm -hmm. the birth of it, but Yiddish theater before that was pretty much Purim Spiel, uh, mm -hmm. plays that were performed at uh, the, the, the festival of uh, Purim. And uh, I believe it was primarily all men. And uh, aside from that, Jewish tradition doesn't look too favorably on theater. But then along comes Alan, take it away. <laughs> uh, and, and then along comes Avram Goldfarn, which is really the beginning of there's a very good book that came out just recently called the, called the Birth of the Modern Yiddish Theater, which is exactly about the Goldfaden era and the Goldfaden revelations. And uh, Goldfaden was, this is at the time of what was called the Haskalah, which is the Jewish Enlightenment. Prior to that period, which was in the mid and late 19th century, um, Jewish culture was strictly either religion, a religious related culture, or people would basically assimilate into the general population. But there was no uh, vibrant Jewish secular culture, that was the Haskalah. Well, literature started, uh, uh, journalism started, and Goldfaden uh, basically was the fellow who brought theater into uh, the Yiddish world. And he started it completely himself. He started with tiny little productions, with tiny little companies with, for which he wrote. In the, Russia, right? He started out in Russia? He did, he did his very first productions were in Romania, and then he very shortly afterwards moved to Russia, and he traveled all around Eastern Europe. He performed in Russia, he performed in, I'm, I'm just about positive, Ukraine, he went to, he went back to Romania. Up until uh, uh, the, well, for the, the latter decades of the 19th century, he was all around uh, that area. He had some great successes in Kiev, uh, so yes, he was in Ukraine, and he uh, then came to the United States, went back, uh, he was peripatetic as Yiddish theater was uh, tremendously at that time. Yiddish theater became very, very quickly a worldwide 
phenomenon uh, it, it, and became highly, it was highly popular in any place where there was uh, an immigrant Jewish population, an Eastern European immigrant Jewish population, which means throughout the Western world, in uh, South America, in South Africa, of course, all up and down North America and Central America, uh, all over Western Europe. Um, and it took off from there. Interest, I wanna uh, um, have a, a little uh, quibble with, with the, a phrase that you use, Frank, if I may, which is Yiddish theater as a form. The truth is Yiddish theater really isn't a form. Yiddish theater is many, many forms. Every possible form of theater you can think of has been done in Yiddish. Uh, it started uh, uh, with very straightforward uh, popular theater and it later expanded to basically and so much in uh, the innovative theater of the 20th century comes from Yiddish theater from various places and various times. Yeah, no, this is quite a remarkable story. Goldfaden who I think came from Romania, was a star in Russia, then had to leave Russia, then he became a big star in Romania, then he had, he was forced out of Romania, came as an older man, almost people thought he was dead already, he came to New York, became a celebrity. I think 100,000 people came to his funeral here and uh, so much of, um, also of American theater through Stella Adler, I think the Adler family was part of his company um, and um, and the idea of musicals, the idea of melodrama, the melodies, and you have a drama, the Broadway music of jazz, klezmer music, the soul um, of um, and also of kind of the Yiddish theater of the clog, the quetching, and so many many other things. It was an important contribution. Um, so, it, uh, yeah, one one specific one. Uh, which is uh, acting style. Naturalistic acting is something in America that came from Yiddish theater. Uh, it was uh, uh, one of the things that was highly, highly prized by <sighs> theater audiences early on was naturalistic acting and the kind of detail uh, in acting that people would recognize. Uh, small bits of business, little turns of character, little acting choices that people would make. I mean, realize you're coming out of the late 19th century, you're coming out of the, act it's the actor manager era, still, and we're used to, in the Western world, a more declamatory uh, style of acting, where everything revolves around the central figure, uh, whereas in Yiddish theater, uh, the supporting characters became very important, and uh, the nature of th their acting style became a real model, and many, many, many non-Yiddish speakers mm -hmm. would come downtown to the Lower East Side to see specifically to watch the acting. John Barrymore would go to Yiddish theater to watch the acting styles. Many of his predecessors would go down uh, uh, to, to, to Yiddish theater to watch the kind of acting they were doing, which as I said, was filled with detail that an audience would watch and they would quell, which means to, to express a certain kind of pride slash pleasure. So natural, they would say, so real. And so much of American screen acting then through actors, but also for the work of the new group which was highly influenced also by the other uh, method in a way, and it's their the direct uh, bloodlines. In incredible um, in a way um, what, what came out um, of that was in a way is were immigrants, refugees, uh, people who were harassed in their own countries came to America and brought part of a culture that then got reintegrated, remixed, uh, we would say hybrid forms um, and came out of it. But, since our talk also is about the time of Corona, how do you guys, how are you doing? We had, for example, people who work in circuses and uh, tap dancers, also forms who are not at the center at the moment, you know, of attention. Even so, I think they really should, especially circus and also tap dance is a great American invention like jazz. Um, so how are you guys doing? How does Yiddish theater work in the time of Corona? What did you do? How did you survive? And um, and uh, accept a trip which you took to, to New Jersey. So we heard about, so what's going on? How are you doing? Elena? Elena, yeah. <laughs> just like everybody else is doing. It was hard the first six months, I think. And then um, I think once someone, one of these two came up with the idea of doing the Dibbuk. Shane, this is all Shane's doing. Shane came up with the idea of doing Dibbuk on online as sort of a supernatural online presence. It really, it, we really felt like we really got busy because there was all of a sudden a lot of things to, to, to do and plan and rehearse and record. And that took 
a while and it feels like things are picking up now and it's much better than 2020 was for me. Um, um, we, so it, it's, we started uh, earlier on in the, in the pandemic, like a lot of people were doing a lot of Zoom plays, a lot of online readings. And then Shane came up with this idea of doing something more substantial. And then we basically, starting with the Dybbuk, uh, we started trying to work towards another form, which is to say an online version of a theatrical experience rather than just a reading with everybody sitting in boxes like we are right now on this chat. And this is Shane's doing, so let me throw it to him. Yeah, uh, sure, there, thereby hangs a tale. Uh, first and foremost, I would say that um, as, as counterintuitive as this might sound, there has been a silver lining to the pandemic for the world of Yiddish. It has grown, as we say, like mushrooms after a rain. It has enabled, I mean, a, a few people like Kolya Borodulin at the Workers' Circle with his Yiddish classes had a, adopted the online format for international learning or even cross-country learning, but it became a necessity once the pandemic hit. And so we had at the Congress for Jewish Culture a Yiddish Seder online. I was very much against anything online. I hate it. I still don't really like it because it's not live theater is just what interests me, live, live performance. But I saw this Seder and we had people from all over the world. And I said, OK, we'll do something for Sholem Aleichem's Yorzeit for the anniversary of his death. And we got people from Israel. From, we had every continent covered. Even, we even had a greeting from Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So uh, with, with a seal rolling in the background and some Yiddish. <laughs> so it became clear that, yeah, it is possible. You know, there is an upside. We can get the best actors from around the world for something. But I had been wanting to save this 100th anniversary production of the Dybbuk for a, for a live thing. And it became clear that, no, this pandemic is not going to be over in December. Uh, so uh, Alan agreed to direct it. And it's really Alan who took that and said, the regular standard Zoom reading will not apply here. So at this point, if you want to talk about that Dybbuk, and when Yelena says all of a sudden we got very busy, I'll tell you that part of the reason they got so busy is because we didn't decide to do it online until about three weeks before the actual hit. And, uh, and Alan worked like a madman to come up with what became a really wonderful production. Alan, do you like to talk about? Uh, Thanks. Well, the, the, well, this, yeah, I, I, I'll try not to repeat what Shane said, but, the, but I think that he, there are a couple of key things we, is the, the weird upside because one of the issues in doing theater in Yiddish is, look, where do you get the cast from? We have a pool of people in New York, a, a fair sized pool of people, but it is still, although I say it's, it's not minuscule, it is still limited. And there are wonderful Yiddish actors in Israel, in Berlin, in uh, one of our, uh, in Strasbourg, although he's now in Argentina, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So this online situation gave us the opportunity to do a, have people work together uh, in a way that would be borderline impossible uh, for re all reasons of practicalities were it not for this situation. And what I tried to do, what uh, is something I alluded to before, which is to say, make it vivid. Try to find ways to you to make the online production feel to the greatest extent possible as if people are in actually in the same space. We found visual ways of doing that to, make, to, make, to, to feel like people are sharing a space like they're sharing the stage space. And also to use visual elements that help in the narrative to replace uh, uh, the things, the, the stage elements that we couldn't normally get. So you can't do a set obviously in, in, a, in an online production like this, but we found visual replacements for that so that we could put them into an environment that becomes itself part of the fabric of the story. Just like in Yiddish theater, the language itself is always so much the fabric of this uh, part of the fabric of the story. And the language, language shape. But just to 
recap, um, a, a theater that, you know, started with Avram Goldfarben, I would say 1870 or 1880, I don't know exactly when, but um, then morphed, transformed, uh, traveled uh, of the world through migration, through, you know, uh, uh, through the, the refugees, the, through immigration, pardon me, folks. Now, all of a sudden, in the time of Corona, a small company, and you are nonprofit, if I understand right, like every nonprofit company in New York City is struggling for survival. All of a sudden, you do a Yiddish fly online with Zoom because you're forced to do it and you seem to like it. You say, we connected to people. People send us greetings from another Arctic with the seal actors we couldn't connect to. Um, do you feel? Um, for your for your form and um, Yiddish theater was so significant. Ellen Stewart's, I think, first theater she had it was a Yiddish theater. She took over as so many on the on the Lower East Side. Do you feel for that form, even though Ellen says it's not one, but for that idea of Yiddish theater, is it a revitalizing thing, or do you think it contributed to the slowly fading of a, of something that is and was so important? Shane, um, yeah. I'm not sure I, I understand the question. You mean the pandemic and Zoom, yeah. if it contributed the to the help the Yiddish theater? Do you think it will be was one more thing? Because if anything, I saw the, uh, the Leo Back Institute, what you guys did. You need to see that live, the, the beautiful, comedic way, the representation on stage and to see something as, you know, as it's also built, something as soulful and uh, playful and melodramatic, but to see it on a screen, on a computer, I cannot think of a bigger contrast. So, but do you think, uh, uh, so this um, form, uh, uh, your way of working, did it help you to go on once it's over to find new ways to have new audiences? I, I, I view it as a blip in, in our history. I think it's something that historians and grad students might study in the future, but I don't think it's going to have a huge change in Yiddish theater for the, the coming decades. Um, I have to argue against the idea of a decline in Yiddish theater um, uh, uh, these days. I think that the audience is perhaps not as strong. I mean, it's definitely not as strong as it was, and there's not as large a pool of talent. But I sat down and figured out the other day that there were seven Yiddish theater companies in New York. Now, only three or four of them are actually producing anything. But on paper, there were this number of Yiddish what theaters. Are the what, what are the names? Well, I mean, I don't want to go too Monty Python on you, but the yeah. first two names I'll mention are <clears throat> the National Yiddish Theater and the Yiddish National Theater. Yeah. Um, the Yelena. What did you say? Not confuse the two. Those are separate organizations. <laughs> yes. There's the National Yiddish Theater, which is the Volkspina. There's the Yiddish National Theater, which is the Hebrew Actors Union. There is the new Yiddish rep, which uh, actually produced Waiting for Godot in Yiddish, the first of all there at the Castillo Theater. Um, there is the Yiddish Public Theater, which really relates to Yiddish National Theater, if you see the names in Yiddish. There is the Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater. Uh, so there are five. There's the Congress for Jewish Culture with its Reuter Kutter Theater that the Moshe Yasur is, is, is directing, and Alan has uh, done some things through it. Then there's Alan's Theater, which is Chobze in Bud, which is a production company, but really uh, it's, it's, a, it's a theater. And there's one or two that I'm leaving out, just because I can't remember all these names. Right. Um, so now we've lost a couple of friends. Huh? So now we've lost a couple of friends, whoever you're leaving out. Thanks a lot. Yes, yes, yes. No, we lost one friend who has two theaters. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, so all of these theaters have brought together an international audience or performed internationally. I mean, brought together international actors or performed internationally. But what Zoom did was allow us to bring together a whole group of people all at once in a way that that was kind of previously unimaginable. I don't know if that will bring in funding that will allow us to do something like a live production of that Dybbuk 
or a live production of Megillah Cycle, which was the second show we did with Mike Burston directing. And in that one, we actually did kind of create sets. Uh, for the Dybbuk, Alan uh, came up with these woodcuts that we put together as a feed between the scenes and kind of, it was eerie how they reflected the action of the play. So then for Megillah Cycle, I, uh, I engaged someone, Adam Whiteman, to create new paper cuts, a very Jewish form of art, that provided the settings for the Zoom boxes, which were then cut in by our brilliant editor, who never edited a thing before in his life, this guy named Uri Schretter, who's in, uh, he's a grad student at Harvard, and basically he can do anything he sets his mind to. But, let, me, yeah. let me disagree with you on one point in response to Frank's question. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think that this, I, Frank, I agree with you absolutely 100%. There is no substitute for a live audience. Theater exists to be a communal moment, to be a communal activity. And you cannot have a communal activity without a bunch of live bodies together in a room. That said, um, this form that has been developed since the pandemic is very useful and I think will continue in uh, uh, despite the fact that we're going to come back to, to please God, some form of normal life. Um, because it allows us to do certain projects that ought to be done that aren't possible to be done without this form. Shane and I have been talking about various <clears throat> scripts from the Yiddish theater canon that would require, if we were to actually to do them for real on stage, insane amounts of resources. Because, you know, back in the day, Yiddish theater, like every other type of theater in the world, a century and a century odd ago, they produced large, they produced casts were always big, there were always multiple sets, and that detail in the sets was very important, etc. The physical part of the production is very important. Uh, so, when you combine the size of the casts and the <clears throat> and the, the physical uh, expenses, the physical difficulties, and the availability of actors, this form is perfect to do if we were to if we want to do a text that would not otherwise be done. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, please, please, we do very much want to get back to performing for a live audience that we are where we are all in the room together sharing the experience. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to add what you said, Alan, reminded me of something. I've met no less than three statisten, spear carriers, we say in English, people who played with Maurice Schwartz's theater back in the day, or say they played with the theater because they went into a couple of shows, you know, carrying a spear. At that time, you know, in, in the 30s, in the 20s, you could put out a call and you could have 40, 50 young people come in and be ready to, you know, go on stage for their hour or, you know, for, for their five minutes at a certain point maybe with no lines or whatever. The last example of that that I've really seen was when we played Carrot O'Brien's God of Vengeance translation at Show World back in the late 90s. We had an open call to Yeshiva Bochrim and people from this Choland group that if you're in Manhattan and you want to see and be a part of this show, just drop in at this hour and, you know, we'd make sure they had on a yarmulke and a jacket and we'd tell them, okay, this is what we're going to do. And they'd go in and be the party guests and then they'd leave or they'd sit in the theater and watch the show. But that's, yeah, yeah, it's true. There might be some more things come out of this that would otherwise be impossible. I, I, I do think so. And it is stunning that, uh, you know, many companies or small companies are putting their small spaces, like, yes, television studios, you know, um, um, out there that uh, they think there will be an online presence, even if everything goes back to normal, but who knows when the next uh, pandemic will come, as many remind us, uh, Bruno Latour and many others, you know, maybe this is just a rehearsal for environmental catastrophes that will come in and it will be, will be much worse. The significance of this play, the Jansky play, the Dippo, just to point out, if I'm not mistaken, I think Peter Brook did it in 1990. I actually saw it. I think Miriam Goldsmith was the great actress 
um, it's a fantastic play. It's part of world, uh, world theater, world history. That, and let's come to that idea of the ghosts or the undead. It seems to be uh, a bit a, a theme, not only in the Dibble, which is kind of the undead, but also what, you know, in the film, the famous opening of the Coen Brothers film, which uh, you both um, so masterfully um, created the idea of the uh, uh, ghost. Marvin Carlson wrote a lot about it, that all of theater in a way is ghosting. We represent dead people on stage, or it's Jan Kott said, it's something between the living and the dead. You don't really know, the light goes out on someone pretends to be someone different, but now you have ghost-like appearances on a screen. You had the devil, the ghosts come up uh, on our screens or projection. Um, how, how did you feel as an artistic engagement with it, maybe also, you know, as an actor and uh, being part of it. Um, was that uh, also a way to engage with the central theme of the play of the undead or something that seems alive, but it's not life? Something that is there, but it's not really there. The big question, what is real and what is not real? We're gonna have Carol Martin back about, she did so much about the theater of the real. So it you know, always has asked that question. So it's Marivo, you know, and other, what's, what is actually real? And, um, and, um, and so we have that here and your plays, your play dealt with that and you did it on Zoom, on screens. And uh, so that idea of a ghosting, you took it very serious, put it out and created something. Did, did, did you work with the medium? Did you reflect all about that? Maybe all of you can answer, but Yelena, maybe you start. Yelena. I, um, I have something to say. Um, mm -hmm. The, it's interesting because you said it felt like because this was basically the first real theater experience we've had. Um, I've had all year, not counting the production in Hackettstown, New Jersey. It felt like a ghost of a theater production. But you just said a real. It was a real theater experience. Yes, it was. It was because. It was sort of a hybrid between live theater and film because we had takes because we recorded it. Uh, we pre-recorded it. This wasn't live on Zoom. We so we had to do several things several times. But it felt like this is you know I am Leia in the Dib book and yet I'm not because it is really hard to do a performance like that, which is it's one of the major roles and it's very hard to, to be possessed by the Dibbuk on Zoom. It literally felt like, uh, not half of, like a, go, a ghost of an experience I would have had on stage had I done it for real uh, in a, on, a, in a, on a big stage with probably the person possessing me very, very close and not in Berlin, uh, but it's, and I didn't really want to watch the final product. And then when I watched the final product, I was like, it, it, it works. Something, even, even out of my, my experience feeling that it isn't real, it was real. And it was real for so many people because the feedback we got was absolutely incredible from all over the world. And, you know, this was us in sitting in our, in our, in our homes and boxes this is not a right, the right word, but pretending we were doing theater and yet somehow it was real for us and it was real for so many people. Yeah. One of the things that uh, worked that, that helped with that production particularly, and this is something I always think is far, far, far too much ignored in modern theater. And it's been, it's been the, the one universal unima, unifying element in all cultures and all societies going back as far as we know is narrative. Uh, we, we have been so fixated for generations on form and so fixated for generations on the artist's experience rather than the audiences and the artist's experience. And the key to that always is narrative. That's the backbone of how we communicate to each other. And the, what we did with the Dybbuk specifically was uh, uh, in the process of adapting it, it was pared down to the, the essentially the narrative. And so much of the stuff that was there for other purposes 
we just kind of peeled away. And that's uh, part of the reason for its success with audiences. Because that's something that people have been interested in going back to Homer. Mm -hmm. um, for, from another angle, I just want to say that the origin of the online production of the Dybbuk dates back to last summer when I was teaching a theater workshop for the YIVO summer program in Yiddish. And I wanted to, I wanted to do something with the Dybbuk in spite of the pandemic. So uh, I called the class, the ghost in the machine, the Dybbuk in the machine. And uh, the Dybbuk is a spirit, a ghost of an undead who possesses your mind. And right, it, you right. Know. And uh, I, I took with that class basically the approach that uh, Jeff Weiss used to take with us in hot keys, and that's how the rent gets paid, uh, which was to uh, give them scenes, and I let them work on them, and then I'd have them come in in on Zoom, and I'd give them a couple of suggestions here and there. I did not direct their scenes in any traditional way. And what we wound up with was a wide range of, of, of uh, style, quality, whatever, but everyone achieved something. The, the scene that probably had the greatest effect was the one directed or, or teched by this guy, Uri Schretter. And that sort of gave the idea later when I approached Alan and said, you know, would you direct this? He said, I need an editor. I need an editor. And I was thinking, we need an editor who knows Yiddish. He knows people who don't know Yiddish who would do it for the little money that would come in. But then I thought, I know someone who knows Yiddish, who knows how to edit. And that's how poor Uri got looped into it. You know, uh, uh, I, I think there are more possibilities for a live production of the Dybbuk that explore the inhabitation and also the, the mechanical or, or, or electronic elements of our current world. But I also think that uh, this this production that Alan uh, really pulled together in an amazingly short amount of time is going to stand as a document for for the rest of time. In fact, I would go so far as to say that as a narrative and as a representation of Ansky's work, of the original author's work, even though it's even more sharply uh, uh, edited than, uh, uh, re redacted than the film that's so well known, that this is the superior product. Um, it, it, uh, it restores elements that are missing from the film and grounds it in a way that just, it, it's, it's quite near and dear to me. Amazing. It's a big thing to say, isn't it? I looked at it uh, and it is haunting. Uh, it asks a lot of questions and, of course, puts you to mind, um, you know, all this, what it deals with anyway, the past, the history, the obsessions, what we carry with us, what we try to escape from. As Kafka said, you know, life is always how to escape, how to get out of um, something, you know, like, and, um, and, but something is holding us back. Uh, is this the first uh, Yiddish uh, production you guys know of on Zoom, which is not just reading, but it was a theatrical, as I say, or as Yelena said, a real theater experience? It's, I haven't heard of anyone, of another one. It's so much probably you a part of theater history. You created in Zoom time as a small company, the very first Yiddish Zoom. There, there were a million little productions of things, you know, yeah. reviews or music yeah. or something like yeah. that. To my knowledge, this is the first. Yeah. Uh, uh, th th this is the first real production of a play that, and certainly that will have lasting value beyond be, beyond just a pandemic entertainment, something of service to get us through this time. And, and, and I, I'm going to repeat something. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm going to repeat something I said before. I mean, the, 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 the thing we learned from that is that we can do uh, certain things online. So um, it would, you know, Shane, the other, Shane and I were speaking uh, recently about a play that I have a particular interest in. Uh, and uh, I've been rolling this play around in my head for a while. And it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, it's a very, very strong piece that could use a revival uh, that, that really could, really needs a, a production. Um, 
and we thought of doing it this way online. It would be basically impossible without massive, massive resources to do it for real. Well, now we are coming to the moment where online substitute theater, to the coin a phrase, is going to be the last thing that anybody wants to see. So that puts us into a weird question ray timing. Uh, do we go on and do uh, 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 this piece in a time when nobody wants to look at theater online? Or do we wait six months a year and say, in the meantime, in the interim, do something with actual humans in the audience? Um, and then go back and then uh, go back and do this. Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. My, I, my prediction is that perhaps it might be like with music, they have a great life acts, but you can go and buy the DVD. In the old days, you had the cassette, uh, you can have it on iTunes, you know, in a low quality, which actually is hurting the brain, as Neil Young pointed out in his research, that we actually might be destroying. This is low resonance things. Uh, our brains so that life music is healing and life theater. But and there might be the uh, the play on uh, on a TV, you know, screen you know, on a projection, which is on Netflix or it's on some online platform. So you have all of it. The life is, and the and the same will be perhaps like in music. The theater will do the same, and a lot of theater companies also in Europe are thinking that. Uh, the digital leg, arm, head, whatever you will say, will stay. There will be next to opera, ballet, drama. There might be the online a component because also audiences, uh, as we always say here, Brecht wrote for the children of the technological age, but now we have the children of the digital age, kids who grew up with the iPhone, iPad in their hand, kids who go to a normal book and try to swipe the images and it doesn't work and they are frustrated. And, um, <laughs> And until they understand, it's a different uh, medium. So um, it will be will be interesting. A question to you guys, uh, coming to that, perhaps also content of Yiddish theater, the idea of being isolated, the idea of uh, the danger outside in the world that you can die at any minute, that the world can collapse, the uncertainty, the in a way the experience of you know of Jewish uh, immigration. Um, how did you guys personally experience it? How did your families experience it? Your fellow artists, uh, uh, what, do you feel it had an additional meaning? Um, we had uh, Carrie Perloff with us, the great director, and she said she went back to kind of a spiritual rethinking of her uh, Jewish history. She was surprised by that, that she did that next to, you know, acting, uh, next to directing online, a uh, writing book on Stoppard and uh, Pitcher and, um, and her uh, online uh, directing, but that was something she went to. How is it? How was it for you, or personally, the experience of Corona? Did it change you, um, Gilena, Elena? It was, it was hard. I mean, in the beginning, it felt like nothing had changed because most of the time, when you're we're not working, we are at home, looking for work, basically um, researching, and I think about. Two months in, it was sort of. It became clear that this is not like the real. This is not just this. It doesn't feel like a slump. It feels more permanent somehow. And mm -hmm. a large family, and everybody's really dispersed. And my parents are a little older, and you know the technology. But there's nobody there to explain the technology to them. It was really hard to sort of connect. You know, you could talk on the phone, but we wanted to see their faces and then the cameras weren't working and they didn't know how to turn it on. And it, it because, and you, you, you're so helpless because you can't help, you know, because you're so far away on this, on the other side of the screen. And it get you, I felt like there were moments where I felt, you know, there's nobody else out there. You know, you, you're in your you're in your little bubble and you go outside when everything, when, you know, the lockdown, lockdown happened, you know, and you go outside on the roof to clap for the doctors at 7 p.m. And that's the only time you see other people on the roofs and the balconies. And it was completely surreal. And then you try talking to them across, you know, the street and not really hearing them. Like you just, you know, wave at them. So like, look, I'm a person, somebody sees me, I see another person. I should let them know I see them. And it's coming now, you know, seeing friends and seeing people, it's like, it's, it's a surreal experience to be able to hug someone. 
to just and to stand so close, you know, face to face and have a conversation. And who knew we took that for granted? Now, I want to tell a little, let me expand on something about your in response to your question about fear of the end during the COVID period. I have to say, I never, I can only speak for myself, but for myself, for a combination of reasons, I never felt the same level of alarm that some other people did. For one thing, uh, not, without going into details, I have a medical history in technicolor. So uh, I've been through, uh, you know, I, I've, I've had uh, any number of delightful things over the years that I've survived. So my instinct is, you know, th this too shall pass. I also have a tremendous historical uh, uh, interest. I have a I'm always, always thinking of anything in historical context. And I'm very aware of what went on in 1919. And I've been, of course, in, early, in earlier human history, we've had far, far, far worse things. I'm not to belittle what do, you know, the, our losses, but in the big picture of all of civilization, the, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a different story. Um, and not that long ago in my own lifetime, we all remember the AIDS crisis. Uh, uh, and we all lost people uh, who were close to us, but we lost in, we lost some people, but it did not end civilization. So I never felt inside that this was going to end civilization. I felt that instinctively that this was going to put us in a weird place for a limited period of time. And what comes out, the, the changes that this has made to everything we know, what will come out of the other end, that I have no idea. That to me is, 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 uh, is, is the great question. But I never feared that this was going to be the end. Um, from, from my own side, uh, I, I did see a, a few people that I really cared for who, who died from this pandemic. One rather early on, a, a pianist uh, by the name of Rick Lunterberg. And it's a, it's a great loss. He wasn't too much older than I am. But uh, uh, I don't know how much fear I was living in with for myself with the pandemic. I was worried about my mother. I was worried about uh, uh, some other people that I know. But I was very happy being uh, my own particular character to spend as much time inside uh, doing nothing as I possibly could. And uh, I think that I think that that has uh, uh, been all right with me to an alarming degree. Uh, it's a good rehearsal for being dead, I guess. Um, uh, uh, I haven't used Zoom except for working type things like these events that we talked about. I haven't really like, hey, let's get together on Zoom and hang out. But maybe that's because what I do professionally is what I would do if I wanted to have fun anyway. Um, the, the one Zoom thing that I really did, the, the, the one online thing that I did with any regularity was a salon with uh, Everett Quinton and other people from the Ridiculous Theatrical Company. Every Wednesday night, we got together through uh, Mark Urson, the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church. He set this up. And that was actually my first online pandemic show was was the the Ring Gott Verblungit, the Ring Cycle of Charles Ludlam that Everett directed for Gay Pride. We had been supposed to do Camille and um, that was not possible. So he put together the Ring Cycle. But uh, uh, um, yeah, that's it. I'm looking forward to a return to real life but it's a funny, sticky thing trying to figure out how and what, you know. My mother's vaccinated, so am I, so I figured no harm in me coming to see her. But uh, like Elena says, there's a, you know, who can you hug? My aunt and uncle came up as well, you know. Who can you hug? Who do you, it's okay, we'll get there. It'll take a little practice. A Yiddish theater will come back more slowly than all other theater, though. I think um, the the audience is a little more health conscious, I think, or or careful than whatever audience. Of course, Jews play a great part of any regular theater audience as well, 
uh, just as an older crowd is a part of most theater anyway. But uh, we'll get there. I knew you to touch on another question, which is, which is a whole other conversation, which is the Yiddish theater audience. And we could go on for days about rebranding Yiddish theater and the purpose of Yiddish theater in this, in this historical, ignoring the corona moment for a second, but in this, his, in this era, in this historical moment, let's say, um, that's, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a great big whopping question, but that's a whole uh, separate conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, this is, these are, you know, and, and all important questions. I also like what you said, Shane, that, you know, it's also experiencing in a way, you know, low level death, you know, what will happen to us. Someone said, uh, when you die, it's the uh, way of nature to tell you to slow down, you know, so, uh, and, uh, and in a way, you know, this virus slowed us down, you know, and everybody said that and it's a good thing, you know, so it is a near death experience, I think, and Theater always has also done that, and um, and uh, what does death mean? All no great stories here. Lots so many are about them. I love death and life. Um, but um, is there something you feel that is inside that idea of your beloved Yiddish theater? And to make sure it's not just only performed in Yiddish, often it's like in English with Yiddish idiom, so audiences can also, of course, understand it. But is something inside Yiddish theater where you feel this? Is or could be important for all for, for the companies. What we what we think about what is important to us, um, um, you know, because we are looking what will happen afterward. Things should be different and still, of course, part of the same in tradition. But is there something where you say um, this is um, something unique to us, and I think it's worth looking at? So, uh, some oh, oh yours. No, I, I'm I'm trying to understand that something about Yiddish theater that's important for yeah, everyone you, else. You know, we know we do something that's you know something that uh, in the soul of it, you know, that is of significance, perhaps especially after a time of Corona. Well, and the the wonderful thing about <laughs> if we can do something after the time of Corona uh, that we can get some nice, significant sized audiences for, as we did in the past by the way, uh, it'll be a lovely kind of rebirth story because of all things, you know, people who are not closely connected with the Yiddish world think that Yiddish theater has been dead for the past 60 years when actually in the last decade or so, the last decade or two, it's been more alive than it's been in, 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 since maybe the mid 20th century. Um, so for, for that, as, as uh, for something to give a feeling of continuance of rebirth, uh, uh, th that's a psychologically healthy thing which everybody needs. So that would be quite nice. Um, also, there's the, 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 the value of the, uh, of the experience itself. Uh, to see something in Yiddish or, uh, means to swim in the water of a specific culture. The very fact of hearing the language, which is, which is the, I, I, it, you cannot replicate it in translation. You can do it with, with, with translation into English. You can do it with hearing the language and reading supertitles over the stage, which is what we do in our productions. Uh, but you can't do it when you translate something into English because you lose the, 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 you lose the essence of the thing. Um, but seeing something in, in Yiddish and hearing that music of that language uh, for a while is a trip to someplace else, which is the thing that we go to a narrative experience for, whether it's theater, whether it's uh, literature, whether it's uh, a film, what have you. I have something to say that's sort of, mm -hmm. it, because we keep talking about the Dibbuk and the, the, the different worlds and the real and not real and the dead and the undead, and it sort of weaves through the entire, um, our entire conversation. There is a a dramatic poem by H. Slavik called A Wedding in Fernwald, written in 1947, after Slavik um, interviewed the Holocaust survivors in, right after 45 and 46 in Europe. And it's about, it's sort of, it's a theatrical piece and philosophical ruminations on the nature of what comes after something major like a major catastrophe like this there's a there's a wedding it's a first wedding after the holocaust and the dead and the living are debating the entire play should there be a wedding 
is it okay? Is it okay to move on? How do we move on? The ghosts of, and, and the, the ghosts are coming and Elijah the prophet is coming and the Messiah is there. Everybody's talking about, do we get past, how do we get past this? Do we get past this? And, you know, the, the living see the dead and the dead see the living. And it's, there's something, it's a profound piece and to utterly worth being done for real. Um, and, but it's sort of, I feel like we just need, we need a little distance from kind of what we're going through right now because it is a little easier to look back when a little time has passed. And I have no doubt that there will be some kind of Yiddish dramatic response, Yiddish theatrical response to sort of what has been happening. It's a, it's, it's a really interesting idea because that's having a, doing a play that has those kind of themes, doing it for real is the perfect way for people to come together as a community uh, after this time of so much loss and share those feelings and those questions. That's what theater is for. Um, yeah, uh, just for what it's worth, I, uh, I put up a little thing with my friend Miriam Chaya Siegel uh, for the Yiddish New York uh, event this past winter, which was a plague wedding, which is a traditional Jewish way of exercising a plague from a community. You take the two least desirable characters that you know, and you conduct a wedding for them in a graveyard. Yeah. So, uh, so Miriam Chaya and I did this in drag. I was the bride, she was the groom. And uh, we, we, we did that at the uh, uh, Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. So that's a little bit of a graveyard. Um, I don't think it got rid of the pandemic, but you know, uh, through the pandemic, there's been a lot of response to the pandemic. The YIVO, and I just saw some call from another Jewish organization uh, asking synagogues to send in diaries of how they've dealt with this. And uh, uh, I don't know, I think the response is going on now, but theatrically for a response to happen, that might take a little time and it might be on some metaphoric level, but uh, it's an interesting challenge. Or, or we might just like try to forget all about it and move on. <laughs> okay, nothing. How interesting! So there was, there is a, a, a ritual to get rid of a plague. In the... Yes. Yeah. It's called a plague wedding or a black wedding because the wedding canopy is black, not white like it usually. Is. is it a real wedding or is it a performative one or? It's it's a ritual. It's sort of you perform it in hope. Um, it, not like an exorcism, but you perform it in hope of, are they? Well, it, it brings you closer to God. A wedding is a joyous event that brings you closer to God. A funeral brings you really close to God. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so doing these two together uh, is, is going to uh, 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 obviously bring the whole community closer to God and perhaps drive away this plague, which could be a punishment for some sin, like somebody dropped the Sefer Torah or the community has done something. So there's this idea behind it. But uh, 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 yeah, that's the, the basic thought. There's a movie about a plague wedding and it is a real wedding because it's a, it's a mitzvah. It's bringing closer to God because you're putting together these two poor people who could never get married in any way. Uh, you you remind me of uh, something out of the something something you said triggered this talking about a historical resonance. Um, the Gosset Theater, the State Yiddish Theater in Moscow, which was one of the greatest producing organizations, one of the most innovative and daring for at least a good chunk of its existence, uh, Yiddish uh, theater organizations in the world. Uh, when World War II was over, after everything that the Eastern European Jews and the Russians went through, instead of doing something like King Lear, which had been their signature production in, for, in the mid 1930s, or any one of the other uh, uh, heavy dramatic pieces, what did they do? They put on a light musical review, which they hadn't done anything like that possibly, I don't know if they had done anything like that ever before, 
they did a show called Freilachs, which was literally a, which, which which means uh, up tempo, you know, happy, happy tune, dance. happy song, happy dance, and they did this in 1947, I believe it was, um, and it's it's it was exactly for that for that communal purpose. They said, "Look, here we are. We've gotten through this. It's over, and now let's let, let's get together and be alive." Yeah, yeah, and I and I think. Um, at least to me, also as a bit, you know, watching from the outside, loving it. I remember Gimple the Fool by Moshe Yasur, the idea to put stories out there and to look at the world in some kind of a fable, you know, the famous, let me tell you a Jewish, old Jewish joke, you know, but actually it has wisdom in it. And in a way, these plays are very big, elaborate ones, and so much humor in it, and so much also sarcasm, and uh, it, as you say, the Jewish humor. And I think something is in there that, over centuries, I think, was developed also to help to survive these catastrophic events to go on to do the next uh, um, and the next uh, uh, level. I, I remember um, there is this uh, joke, a Holocaust survivor comes to God and um, they meet and God says, I'm glad you're here. Um, and uh, he asks, you know, what, uh, uh, how are you? And he says, fine, the survivors, I'm gonna tell you a joke. And God says, I'm not sure if that's a good idea. I don't know. He says, no, no, no. Um, it's, uh, uh, it is um, uh, uh, about the concentration camps. And God says, well, that's not funny. And the survivor says, I guess you had to be there. You know, you, you so um, what, what an incredible level of dealing with something so complex, so undescribable. And what families are going through now is so many also black actors or uh, playwrights we spoke to directors who said we are all making our wills because our we are the families on the lines we don't have health insurances you know what will happen to us you know how to how do you really deal with with this is uh, what seemed to be a year and a half or two years ago unimaginable you know so there is something i think in that experience as with so many other cultures and traditions of course also but especially in there i think there's something that is worth to, to engage with because it's a deep, uh, deep wisdom of survivors of catastrophes um, um, in there. Um, my my um, question also um, for you, uh, um, what will you be doing? What, what do we have projects? Uh, um, we say we're gonna travel or what is gonna happen in your, in your artistic, in your life? What, what change? Will you focus on something different uh, before or what's in store for you? This, 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 is, this is a perfect note to end on. Something that Shane uh, is responsible for that we're going to be doing together. And some, something that could, could not be a more cheery way to get out of this, uh, get out of the, you know, of, of the, the corona year. Go ahead, Shane. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're getting ready to take uh, Moshe Yassour's staging of Waiting for Godot in Yiddish to the Royal Dramatic Theater in Stockholm. Uh, this November. Uh, we're pretty excited about it. It's the first time that the Royal Dramatic Theater is presenting a show in Yiddish, maybe anything in Yiddish. That's what the Swedes tell me. And uh, so we'll play there and then we'll play uh, one show in Malmö in the south. And uh, I think that'll be, a, that'll be a great cap to this whole thing for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Because what could be more fun than watching Godot? Yeah. Well, in, in Yiddish, it's a little different than it is in English. It comes across, uh, it comes across, even Alan, who doesn't necessarily like the play, saw Moshe's staging and said, this I like. <laughs> and uh, Frank, uh, let, me, let me interrupt because let me, let me, one, one thing about the, uh, about the Godot, since, because we're on that briefly before we wrap. Um, it's Shane's translation of Godot, and I've seen productions of Godot. I was in an excellent production of Godot in English at Two River Theater in New Jersey. Uh, it's just never been my favorite play for a combination of reasons. And then in Shane's translation and Moshe's production, um, I had been asked to be in it originally, and I passed on it because I just wasn't interested. And then Yelena and I went to see it in the middle of, in that, of that first production. In the middle of the first act, we turned to each other in the audience 
we weren't eager to go because, you know, we both know the play sideways and, you know, it's not our favorite play. And in the middle of the first act, we turned to each other and spontaneously and go, this is terrific. Yeah, and they interrupted the show, but it was okay. <laughs> what Shane and Moshe did, and this is uh, profound, profoundly important, not only for Godot, but for theater period, I believe, is so often Godot is it has has layered on it levels of intellectuality and distancing from the audience and pretense that takes it away from the human essence. And what Shane's wonderful Yiddish, which is better than Godot's English, I mean that, and Moshe's smart straightforward direction did was it stripped all that away and we were able to look at these people. We looked at these two absolutely universal figures, these two idiots standing there that we can all identify with, standing there and trying to figure out why we are all here and what is what is the purpose? What are, what are we waiting for? What is it about? And that 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 is, was was the genius of that production. And I wish all theater of every kind could do that. Could could cut thing cut cut through the unnecessary and get to the human. Yeah, in, in, incredible. I missed it when, it when it played here, and we all know that also through Beckett, it is clearly referenced, originated from the experience of the Holocaust. Um, yeah, the, the, the origin of play. By the way, we but uh, um, I, I meant I meant to mention we did the I, I later joined the production and we did it uh, here in uh, in Greenwich House. But we took the play to the International Samuel Beckett Festival in Ireland, and uh, we did 10 or 11 performances there. There were almost no Yiddish speakers there. It was in Yiddish with the English translation supertitles. And I cannot tell you how many people came to us and told, and they all said the exact same thing. I have seen Godot many times. Mm. I spoke a word of Yiddish, but this is the first time I understood the play. This is the first time. Yeah, and Beckett, Beckett would be turning in his grave <laughs> at the thought that people thought they understood the play, but it's 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 true. That's maybe the greatest compliment that I've uh, I've uh, gotten for for that uh, translation or involvement with the production is Irish people saying it's the first time I understood Godot. <laughs> uh, amazing. This is a play, of course, that somehow comes up in these catastrophic times, Susan. Uh, Son uh, um, Susan Sontag famously did it, you know, in the crisis of in the Balkans. Um, I think Paul Chan staged it with the classical theater of Harlem um, uh, in the after Katarina in New Orleans. A fantastic outdoor production where he refused to do inside the theaters. People that told him no one will come. Thousands came for those two weekends, and what you did there certainly is um, remarkable. It's important. One wonders why it's not touring, why it's not showing, and it's okay to have subtitles. Why not? We see so many films now. It should also be um, in theaters, the Yiddish theater, the National Yiddish Theater in Romania, which is actually across the national theater in Romania. Um, I, I Maybe one actor is left who is really a toolish, quote unquote, a Yiddish actor, but they are Romanian actors. We learn Yiddish and the audience still come and enjoy the place. It's an incredible phenomenon what's going on there. And why not here, also in a city, so uh, such a big tradition and heritage? You know, why are your companies struggling so hard? Um, why is it so tough to find places? And uh, why is it easier to get a recognition? Uh, in Sweden or in Ireland for a work that is of significance and also connected to uh, New York history and to world drama. So um, amazing to think that perhaps, of course, someone will email us, no, there was another production, but as far as I know, the series, first series, online Yiddish theater production happened uh, on Zoom in, in, in this year of Corona and questioned everything. As Mita Rao said in our talks, you know, question everything, redo everything, and then go on to what you did and i think this is what you guys did so thank you for that little update um on um on, on who you are what you are doing um you know, the, the theater if you keep uh, alive uh, and you put it into the center um of your um of your existence on earth is the theater and art is a way of living it's perhaps also a big provocation and when you said we sit at home we wait for a lot of theater People, nothing has changed so much. A lot of theater people never had jobs. They don't, never have a theater to play anyway. They don't, you know. They, so it, what is the very big difference, you know, because maybe 
um, there are less jobs outside to support it, you know, but uh, um, it seemed like a lot of theater already lived under conditions of Corona for a very long time without realizing it. So thank you um, all for joining. I, we could go on much, uh, much longer. Um, I watch uh, uh, Yelena and Ellen in the Cohen Brother movie, so we get a bit more, maybe try to get a copy of the, of the DVD in the back and maybe one theater will put it on here in New York and invite you after this talk. It certainly um, is um, um, of, um, of importance. And we go on um, this week um, with, uh, with our Siegel talks. We have David Gotthard who ran the great Riverside Studios uh, in London. And the time in the Riverside Studio was the Riverside Studio. Back at rehearsed there. Uh, Giacometti was there. It was uh, Tchaikovsky filmmakers. Canto rehearsed there. An amazing place. Uh, something that, from what I, um, I heard and saw, so, you know, something unrivaled, um, uh, even um, uh, unmatched. So it is quite um, an extraordinary. I think hopefully again talk um, and that we will have. So um, join us, uh, be with us. And you guys, thank you for taking the time. Thanks for HowlRound for hosting us. And um, to uh, all our listeners, um, thank you for taking the time uh, out of your busy life. So much more talks are out there now. It is important, uh, of course, also as an archive, I think for the future, we are archiving the moment and the history here. So, um, but still, thank you. Um, so much for um, for taking the time and for being with us. And tomorrow we have um, the great Carol Martin. We mentioned her today. Is the idea of the theater of the real? Uh, the question: What is it? Mean, she is a field. She co-created. She co created She wrote about the idea of the documentation of work, documentary theater, a theater that engages in many forms with the real. And we will hear from her. Um, and tomorrow about her work, her research, and what she thinks has changed in the time of Corona, or what has been confirmed, what she has been writing about, and what might happen. So this is important, and she will join us again with Emily Mann next uh, uh, next week, uh, who will talk about her work. We're going to have an update from the Great Edinburgh Festival, and um, so um, we will uh, hear from around the world, from here, from a Polish and Turkish producer in Berlin. They did an artwork on the Balkanese artists uh, in the Prince Tower Burke neighborhood, some of them quite significant, important ones who live close to each other, created work on their balconies outside. And it was really successful. People loved it. Thousands of people watched it. So let's see what other cities did in the world during this time. And like you who put together this, um, this production. So thank you all. And um, uh, I hope you uh, will, will join us again. And we need great theater, great artwork, but we also need great audiences. And it's important to listen. And this is what this is all about, a radical listening. And it's important what, what the artists have to say. So thank you guys. And I hope to see you in person soon. Bye-bye.